Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming. Uh, this is Elder Law 101. We're delighted to welcome back Attorney Atha Bergeron, who is a guru on all things Elder Law. All things old. All things, all things old. old, yeah. I was trying to be nice. But. <laughs> um, so we're so glad to have all of you come today. Um, I, you've done this presentation for several years now, with, so this is the latest and greatest. Latest and greatest, that's right. All right. Um, so welcome. I so thank you very you. much. You're welcome. Our pleasure. Thank you. And thank you for your hospitality. Thanks to the folks at the, at the Holliston Council on Aging for inviting me to come. I really, really appreciate it. It's thank our you. pleasure to have you here. Thank you. Um, so if you haven't been here before, my name is Arthur Bergeron. I'm an attorney. Uh, I work at Myrick O'Connell. Uh, there are se 70 of us now, about 40 in Worcester and about 20 in uh, Westboro, which is where I spend most of my time, and about 10 in Boston. Because there are so many of us, everybody gets to do what they like. Because if you got a different kind of question, you can just ask somebody else. So all I do is elder law because I'm old, right? I love elder law because my clients still think I'm young. It's to my median client age is 74. So one of the uh, presentations that I've tried to do each year, I do presentations at, at, at several senior centers. And the first one every year is basically a, a what did I learn last year and what changed last year? Because a lot of times something changes and you want to know about that. But a lot of times, too, I'll just learn something that was there before, but I didn't know it. And I think, and I want to talk about a couple of those examples today, too. So um, if you have been here before, then you know um, that I always talk about my make-believe couple, Frank and Mary, and their kids, Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr. And, and basically, their, their, life, their goals are very simple. They want to live in their house until they die. They want to be buried in the backyard. If one of them dies, they want to leave everything to the other one. If the two of them are dead, they want assets divided among their kids. Does that sound like a familiar kind of estate plan? So we got, that's what we're going to talk about. And, and when they come in to see me, um, they, they typically want to talk about three things. They want to talk about dealing with life, dealing with death, dealing with life after death, and dealing with what remains. So we're going to talk about all those things. They think that they just want to deal with what remains a lot of times. They're talking about what happens after they're dead. But really the most important one is what happens while they're alive. Because, you know, after they're dead, when you're dead, you're dead, you know? And you're not worried about a lot of this stuff. But while you're alive, you know, there's really things to worry about. Dealing with the bank and dealing with the government and dealing with your doctors in the hospital and a bunch of other stuff. So I want to start off talking about those and about what I learned. It's, I learned several things this year which I really kind of was unaware of as a result of some of the cases that came up. I'm going to talk about those. So I'm going to... These are the life documents that you need, your health care proxy, medical authorization, and power of attorney. Everybody knew you needed two of those, right? Health care proxy and the power of attorney. What's a medical authorization? We're going to talk about that in a few minutes. Health care proxy, how many have one? Raise your hand. Look at that. That's terrific. So you know already then that to do a valid health care proxy, you need to have two witnesses. Copies of them are valid. Uh, you want to give it to your doctor. You don't want to just leave it hanging around in the house. You want to give it to your doctor so that if there's an emergency and you go to the hospital, the doctor can email it to the hospital. No one's looking around for a power, the health care proxy. Remember, the health care proxy is revoked every time you sign another one. So if you go to the hospital without your proxy and the, doctor, and the guy, lady in the emergency room says, well, you know, you've got to sign here uh, while you're here because we need to know there's a proxy on file in case something happens while you're here and you sign that proxy, you've now revoked all your other proxies, right? You've revoked the one that was at home. And so that, so better, that's why I say, is to have it with your doctor, and then if you need to go to the hospital, have your doctor send it over. Tell the hospital, call the doctor, he'll just email it over, and that way everybody's covered, and, you, and you've still got that proxy that you thought was valid, right? Um, you can revoke it at any time, your proxy at any time. Um, if you disagree with a medical decision being made by the person who is your proxy, that immediately revokes the proxy. So if you're in a room with the, you're in the hospital and you're in a room with the doctor and your proxy and the doctor has even declared that you can't make a medical judgment and he's talking to the proxy and he says, I, do you want to operate? And the proxy says, no. And you say, yes. That has the effect of revoking the medical proxy. And, back, and basically, you're, and you're presumptively competent, no matter what, for purposes of revoking the proxy. Because the, the law is really designed to make sure that you are as empowered as possible. Okay? The alternative to these proxies um, is to get a guardianship appoint, a guardian appointed for you to make medical decisions for you. And, and that's wicked, it's expensive, it's time consuming. That's why you always want a proxy. Okay? Um, 
and I'm going to talk quite a bit about the proxies today because there are a few things, you, everything I just said you probably know, there are a few things that you probably don't. Um, so what the, the, the proxy becomes effective if the doctor says, I'm going to take all questions at the end, um, if, the doc, if the doctor says in writing you lack the capability to make or communicate health care decisions. And what he's saying at that point is that that proxy gets to do that, okay? Um, it, now, one of the thing, once that proxy is in effect, by the way, from then on, the proxy rules. Even if you've written some kind of instructions, which you probably may have done in some kind of living will or the five wishes or something saying, here's how I want to be treated, none of that is legally binding, okay? Living wills are not legally enforceable in Massachusetts. So once the proxy is in control, the proxy is in control. So what you really want to do is you want to talk to that proxy about how you want to be treated. You probably want to put some of that in writing, not because it's legally binding, but because it's helpful to the proxy so they don't feel guilty among other things. Oh, I don't know if we should really, you know, unplug Ma. Well, Ma said, I want to be unplugged, you know, in these cases, it helps. Or if there are several siblings, so that she, the proxy, who is the only person who, can, who has the right to make these decisions, can talk to the other siblings and say, look, this is what Ma wanted. This is what so-and-so wanted. That's what, what Honoring Choices is all about. And I urge you to, actually, to, to, uh, to, to look at their stuff. Um, you know, Google Honoring Choices, it's a statewide program developed as a, by a nonprofit. Um, we're actually some of the Honoring Choices ambassadors and our goal is to encourage people to do what you've done to have the proxy but also to have this other statement to help your proxy because remember that proxy can be in effect it isn't like the you know you, you just had the, you know, the accident and you know you're at the hospital and now the proxy is going to be involved for a day that proxy could be involved for a year you might have had a stroke now you can't make decisions for a long time and there are all these questions that are going to come up you get sick, do you want to get well, right? You know, what do you want in that situation? You know, I've got clients who would say, if I, don't, if I can't be communicating effectively with people and I get sick, you know, in the meantime, you know, I'd just rather, don't try to get me well, right? Others people would say, no, I'm okay with, with not being able to communicate as long as I'm feeling okay. I don't want to be in pain. I know for myself personally, I always say, if the doctor told me, you get two choices. You can be in a lot of pain for a week, and you, or you can be in a lot of pain for a year. And in either case, you're going to die. But you're going, you can, here's your choice. I'll take the week. You know, I'll take the week if, they're not, if I'm not getting better. But that's my choice. That's not your choice. So you want to be able to write that down. So the, the second document that you want is a HIPAA authorization. The reason for that is that health care proxy only takes effect at the point at which the doctor determines that you can't make a medical decision. At that point, your proxy is authorized to talk to your doctor and to get your medical records. Before that, no, no. So even if you're in the hospital and you, and you want somebody to talk to the doctor because you're in the hospital room and you don't know what, you know, especially you're not interested in talking to them, that proxy does not have the right to talk to the doctor, get your medical records, and then come back and have a conversation with you, because it's probably like your spouse or your daughter or your son, unless they, and, and if you haven't been determined to be, in, to be incapable of making a medical decision, unless you've also done a HIPAA authorization. And you can do any number of these to any number of people. It doesn't have to just be to the proxy, right? That's, and that's the other advantage of these authorizations. Often clients will come in and say, well, you know, I want all my kids to be involved in these decisions. And I'll say, well, you know, as far as the proxy is concerned, you can't do that. You can only have one person at a time because if I'm the way the proxy law works, if I'm the doctor, I don't want to have to talk to a whole bunch of people. I don't want to hear arguments among your kids about what to do. So I'm going to listen to one person, that's just the proxy. But you can authorize all your kids to have your medical records and to talk to the doctor about what your condition is so that they can be having conversations among themselves and everybody's got the information. That's not a bad idea. And we're going to talk about this a little bit more. Um, now, so this is new from last year. It just came into effect last year. In addition to the healthcare proxy law, the CARE Act, Caregiver Advice Record and Enable Act, C-A-R-E. I don't know why they always have to have acronyms. acronyms. Did anybody, have anybody heard of this? No. So 
This came into effect last year. It was, it was authorized by the legislature the following year, or the previous year, rather. And it says that if you go to the hospital, and this only applies to hospitals, that the hospital has to ask you if you want to designate a caregiver. Now, that caregiver could be the person who is your proxy or not. You can name whoever you want. But whoever that person is, before you're going to get, when you get your notice of the discharge from the hospital, so do they. The hospital is required to notify that person. And you've all heard those kinds of cases of people go to the hospital and they're like pushing them out the door the next day, right? Oh, yeah. And a lot of times it kind of comes as a surprise to the person at home, the caregiver. So now they're required to notify the caregiver, whoever you say of the discharge. They're required to give the caregiver your discharge plan. And if, and if the discharge plan involves the necessity for care for that person at home helping you with certain things, then they need to train the caregiver. They're required to train the caregiver if there's anything that you need that you need to be trained on. So it's really wonderful. It, you now remember, that is not necessarily your proxy agent. The mere fact that you've named a proxy doesn't mean under this statute that that's your caregiver, right? You can name anybody you want. It can be the proxy agent, but it doesn't have to be, okay? Uh, powers of attorney, powers of attorney. You don't need witnesses for a power of attorney, at least not for things, for your assets in Massachusetts. If you own something out of state, that may be different. You know, we just did a power of attorney for a lady who's got, she lives on Martha's Vineyard, but she's got, she's, her home's in New Jersey. So we want, and, and in New Jersey, you need two witnesses, so we needed to make sure it complied with the rules in both states. But for here, no witnesses. Notarization is not necessary. You can sign a power of attorney without a notaris, notarization but always have the notarization, always, always. The reason for that is the, the person deciding whether the power of attorney is valid or not is not like a lawyer or a, or a judge. It's like the lady at the bank, right? Your daughter goes to the bank and says, Ma, sign me this power of attorney, and she's not feeling, I want to you know, write checks. And the lady at the bank's going, nah, I don't know if this was valid or not. You know, this, it's an amazing thing I've seen. I've been practicing for 41 years. I'm always amazed by people see a notary seal and they go, oh, that must be a legal document. It's like a notary seal. That's why you do it. It doesn't have to be there. The only time it has to be there is if, you were, if somebody was signing a deed on your behalf or something that gets recorded in the registry. But you always want it, okay? Um, power of attorney, you can revoke at any time. You can also, in the, in the case of the power of attorney as opposed to the proxy, name more than one. You can do it one of two ways. You can, you can have a bunch of powers of attorney, one to your daughter, one to your son, and one to your, you can actually give them individual documents, and the fact that there's a bunch of them out there doesn't mean that any of them have been revoked. So any one of those people can act on your behalf. You can have one document in which you actually say, I name two people or three, jointly and severally, jointly and severally, so any one of those people can act for you. It, it, so if one of your kids isn't around, the other one can do it and vice versa, right? So you, can, you, you have all of these options and uh, powers of attorney can be revoked at any time, like healthcare proxies. Um, if you're revoking it though, this just came up, um, you want to, you, and you're concerned that you're revoking it because you're afraid your attorney may be abusing their power uh, and may want to run, the, maybe trying to get to the bank and take your money, then you ought to tell the bank too that you, revo you revoked this. And the reason for that is the typical power of attorney, and I know the ones that we draft, has a provision in it designed to make them more workable that says that the person that you named as the attorney, if they give a, a sworn statement, an affidavit to the bank or to the insurance company or to whoever saying that the power of attorney is still valid, then that other person is bound to accept that fact and doesn't have to question any further and is not liable if they deal with them and something, and it turns out that you revoked it and they didn't know, okay? So if you're revoking the power of attorney and there are some, you know, there are some specific places where you don't want that person to go, like to your bank, then you want to notify those people also, okay? Um, so, I want to go back now to the healthcare proxy. Um, when the, when the, when the, when the um, uh, doctor is making this determination that you are not able to make a medical decision, this is, the this is the words from the statute. The determination is solely for the purpose of empowering an agent to make health care decisions pursuant to a health care proxy. Nothing else, nothing else. All the health care proxy does is it says once your doctor says you can't make a medical decision, the proxy can do it. 
the proxy does not then become authorized to do anything else except make medical decisions. And the fact that the doctor has said that does not mean that you are not competent to sign other documents like powers of attorney or wills or deeds or anything. The, 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 the only person that can determine that you're not capable to sign those documents ultimately is a judge. So this is, and the reason why I say that is this, this is almost always misinterpreted in the medical field. You go to the hospital, you go to a nursing home, you go to any of these places, they'll say, oh, this, 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 this person's healthcare proxy has been invoked, whatever that means. It's not a real legal word, invoked. It's just become kind of the, the word to use, meaning that the doctor has said you can't make a medical decision. And therefore, our patient or our resident can't sign any of these other, can't sign a document. You know, you can't come in here and have them sign any of these documents. That is false, right? And the person who is deciding immediately whether you can sign a new will are the two witnesses that are watching you sign and the notary and saying, oh, it appears to us that this person is of sound mind. In the case of a power of attorney, if there's a notary, the notary is making that determination. And if somebody wants to challenge it, they can, but they're going to have to challenge it in court. But the fact the proxy has been invoked has nothing to do with any of that, okay? Um, so, in the, in the cases that I've been giving you, we've been assuming that Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr. Are, Jr. are angels, that they all get along with each other, they get along with you, Every, no one's got any problems. So, but this year we had a couple of cases that I want to I go through. Sometimes that's not the case, right? Suppose, you know, Peter is really not the angel that everybody had hoped, and Paul and, 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 and Mary Jr. really are, are really trying to look after, you know, dad's best interest. But, but what do we do? Because Peter is the proxy in the healthcare and the, in the, has the power of attorney. So here are the facts. This is a real case. Uh, Mary has died. Frank previously had appointed Peter as the backup alternate on the power of attorney and the healthcare proxy. Frank's not doing great. He's still basically okay, but his memory's kind of fading. So he moved away from his house um, which, and, and moved into a memory care unit and assisted living. Um, Peter sold the house exactly where the proceeds are, we're not sure. And, and, um, P, and, and the doctor has invoked the healthcare proxy, has said that Frank can't make a medical decision. And Peter has then told the kids, stay away from dad. Um, he's, not, he's not giving him any access to any of his medical information. He's not giving him access to any of his financial information, including one, where did the proceeds of the house go? And two, what happens to all of dad's bank accounts, the million dollars actually, that was in you know, stock accounts and an IRA and this and that. And he's even saying that he's not, he doesn't want Paul and Mary Jr. to visit Frank at the assisted living, right? So what can they do? So in that, in, now before you think about what they can do, I just want to mention kind of as an aside, elder abuse. There's no such thing as elder abuse. As a, it, well, for my purposes as a lawyer, elder abuse is not a crime. So if, if, you're, if P Paul and Mary Jr. are thinking that Peter is like doing these bad things and, and, some, and somehow she's going to get some, they're going to get some relief from the DA or from the police department, they're not unless they can, be, unless they're saying something else. They can't just be saying it's elder abuse. Elder abuse isn't, is, you know, they can say, be saying we think someone's stealing you know, or that there's a physical abuse, I mean, that's something else, assault and battery, but elder abuse isn't a crime. Elder abuse also is not a cause of action. I can't sue somebody because they have done something to me which I am calling elder abuse. The fact that it's elder abuse, that, that doesn't exist as a legal concept, okay? I can sue them because they stole something, or, but see, see get that notion? So what could Paul and Mary Jr. do? So, as I've discussed with them, if, if, first of all, if, if Frank had ahead of time given them medical authorizations as well as giving Peter medical authorizations, then at this point they could just go call the hospital and the doctor and find out how dad's really doing, right? Um, if not, um, dad could always sign new medical authorizations right now, right? He, dad could sign a new medical authorization to Paul and to Mary Jr. without revoking Peter's so that now everybody's kind of in the same position. Um, dad could revoke um, um, Peter's, uh, health, Peter's power of attorney. Not likely that, dad's gonna, that he's going to do that, though, you know, because this is the one that he trusted. That's why he named him as the successor on the power of attorney. 
But dad could also name the others as, on, as, as attorneys. And remember the mere fact that the, that the healthcare proxy was invoked doesn't prohibit him from doing any of those things. And now all of the kids can go to the bank and find out what's going on with dad's money. And if one of them with a power of attorney thinks the other one with the power of attorney is abusing their responsibilities, now they can go to court on behalf of dad because the kids otherwise couldn't go to court on behalf of dad because they don't have the power of attorney, right? Unless they get a guardian or a conservator appointed, right? Which is a pain to get a guardian or a conservator appointed by the court. You have to convince the court that Frank in this case can't make these kinds of decisions on his own, which means first you need a doctor's certificate, a, a lengthy, it isn't even a certificate, it's a multi-page document that the doctor has to file with the probate court explaining the, the father, the, the Frank's condition and describing why in the doctor's opinion this person can't make these decisions. The doctor can't make that decision himself, as I said, it's not his power, only the judge can do that, right? But he's got to fill in this big long form Doc, doctors hate doing this. They hate it, especially if it's their own client, patient, and they don't want to be saying this, and they don't want to take the time. I mean, they're really busy. They're not getting paid for this, right? So it's very hard. Then you go to a probate court, and there's, everybody gets notices, and there's legal fees that everyone's paying. It's terrible. So people often will come in thinking that I'm going to tell them, oh, this is a great, you know, yes, we can do a guardianship. And I'll tell them, yes, but here's what you're going to have to accomplish. It's going to cost you $10,000, $15,000, because the time involved in putting that together and then going to court and sitting around in a, in a courtroom while you wait for these cases to hurt, it's very time consuming. So you just don't want to go there, which is why a better use of the healthcare proxies and the powers of attorney is the right way to go. Um, so now let's take the opposite case. Let's say that Frank, that, that Peter is really the good kid. But Paul and Mary Jr., yeah, you know, one of them's been divorced, one of them's got creditor problems, and all of a sudden, Dad's not feeling so hot, and the kids are like around now. Like, oh, Dad, you know, I don't, I don't think Peter's, you know, doing the right thing here, you know. Or, gee, you know, well, I got some problems, you know. The house is about to get foreclosed. I really need $40,000. You know, these are cases, I've seen all the, have you ever heard of cases like this? You know, this happens, right? So the question then in Peter's case is, he's got this power of attorney, but of course the power of attorney, as we have said, can be revoked at any time. So now what, does, what can Peter do? What can Peter do? And the answer is, and so here are the facts, Mary has died, Peter is the trustee, uh, or Peter is financially secure, Paul and Mary Jr. are broke, you know, they've got problems, Frank is frail, Peter fears that Mary or Mary Jr. or Paul might try to get the power of attorney revoked or otherwise take advantage of dad. So what we do in those cases is we tell Peter, create a trust, create a trust. Name yourself as the trustee of the trust. For the benefit of who? For the benefit of dad. Take all of his assets because you have the power to do that on his behalf with the power of attorney. Transfer them all to yourself as the trustee of the trust and say right in the trust that following dad's death, the assets get divided according to dad's last will and testament. So if Paul or Mary Jr. come in and say, oh, you know, you stole dad's money. No, I didn't. I did exactly with it what he wanted. I'm holding the money for dad's be in dad's behalf, and when he dies, the money goes according to his last will and testament, right? So once again, there are solutions to this, and this way, you don't need a guardianship, you don't need a conservatorship, you don't need all of that fighting in the legal fees. Not that there's anything wrong with legal fees. I don't want you to think there's anything. But you don't, need, you don't need to do it, okay? And these are much, much more sensible ways to get those problems done. Now, Mass Health 101. The big lesson for this year is nothing changed. I know, and I say that because last year I came here, last spring, and Mass Health at that point had proposed in the fall of 2016 a ton of changes to their regulations regarding how you become eligible, regarding how you treat the house, regarding their rights to go after, to lean the house and go after assets after you die, all kinds of changes. And they said they were going to make those, and they, 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 they it show, showed them as draft regulations and said, we're going to make these regulations effective no later than February of 2017. Now, the last time I was here, it was after that, but not much after. So I said, oh, these are coming. 
So now it's a year later and nothing has happened, right? So I'm here to tell you there's one regulation that has changed, and I'm going to go through that one. Uh, but other than that, nothing has changed, and it doesn't appear at this point that anything is going to change. This is, this is my sense. If th something major does, I'm going to be coming here, uh, I think, three more times this year. If something changes, then that seminar, I will talk to you about what has changed. Um, that having been said, you do need to make sh to show, I have talked here about these kind of basics. I just want to make sure that everybody is familiar with how the system now works. So unless there's a change, this is how it works. Um, pretend you're Frank and Mary, and Frank and Mary have a house that's worth $300,000, and they have an IRA, he has an IRA worth one hundred fifty, and he has an annuity worth a hundred. Mary's named as the beneficiary. They have bank accounts worth seventy-five. So their total assets are worth six hundred twenty-five thousand uh, dollars. Frank's income is from Social Security, fifteen hundred, and a small pension for five two thousand a month. Mary's is seven fifty, Social Security, half of Frank's. Mary didn't work when she was younger; she was taking care of the kids. Um, and now, if Mary, say Mary needs nursing home care today, and that's the situation with their assets. In that situation, Mary can almost immediately qualify for Mass Health. And the reason why she wants to do that is if she's in the nursing home for more than 100 days, Medicare is not going to pay for those nursing home days. And therefore, she's going to be paying privately until she's on Mass Health. And, and the privately means probably twelve dollars to $14,000 a month. That's about the price right now. Um, once she's qualified for Mass Health, she'll have to pay her $750 a month to the nursing home, that Social Security check, minus a small adjustment. Everything else will be paid by Mass Health. So she really wants to qualify for Mass Health. But she can qualify while she, has, while she cannot have more than $2,000 in countable assets. Her husband, her husband can own the house can have other assets worth up to $123,600 and can have unlimited income, unlimited income. So if Mary needed to qualify for Mass Health today, I would tell Mary, transfer the house to just Frank, um, transfer all the other money to just Frank, right? Have Frank keep not more than $123,600 and use the rest to buy an annuity. As long as that annuity calls for equal monthly payments over a term that is shorter than Frank's life expectancy, according to the Mass Health chart. There's one chart. No matter how sick or well he is, that his life expectancy is on this chart. Um, as long as it calls for equal monthly payments over a term shorter than his life expectancy, the, the, the purchase of the annuity is a legitimate conversion from a countable asset to a non-countable income stream. So the day after Frank buys that annuity, Mary can qualify for Mass Health. Because now she has less than $2,000, he owns the house, he has cash of less than $123,600. Um, now, it has been, or it was until early last year, that if Frank did that, and Mary was on Mass Health, now in Mass Health is paying the nursing home bill, and Frank then died, and some of the annuity payments hadn't come in yet, because you remember it calls for, has to call for equal monthly payments over a term, not over to his life over a term, so th then he could have said that whoever he wants to, wanted to name as the remaining beneficiaries for those remaining payments, could have been his kids, could have been anybody. As of the spring of last year, that changed. So in that situation, under the current law, um, the, the first beneficiary, if Mary were still alive, or even if she weren't, if Mary had accrued a mass health bill, because Mass Health, Mass Health was covering her nursing home payments. Mass Health would then have a lien on those remaining um, uh, annuity payments to get repaid. So what we're telling folks, given this regulatory change, is that if you're in this situation and you're frank and you're going to go buy that annuity, make the annuity for as short a term as possible so that you make sure that you've got the money back. And the reason for that is as long as he's got the money back, as long as, and so it's in his name when he dies, and as long as he has changed his will to say that following his death, all assets that he owns that would have gone to his wife, remember that was their plan, right, will instead go in trust for the benefit of his wife, then all those assets are going to be safe. The house, whatever cash he has, it's all going to be safe. Now, he can't do that plan and also avoid the probate process. I'm just mentioning this because... Younger people come in to me and, and 
their goal a lot of times in terms of what they want legally is they want a device to avoid the probate process and I can give them that but that device wouldn't wouldn't provide this kind of protection so usually the older folks are the more they want the mass health protection as opposed to probate avoidance but the, the but the will would need to say Frank's will would need to say when I die I want all assets that would have gone to Mary instead to go in trust for her benefit then following her death the assets would go to the kids. If he structures things that way, the kids control the assets following his death. The kids can use those assets in any way they think appropriate to help Mary. If she's not in the nursing home, she, they can just give her the money. If she is in the nursing home, they can provide extra care for her. But the bottom line is those assets aren't countable or leanable if Mary is already on MassHealth or later needs to qualify for MassHealth, okay? So what if, though, um, they hadn't done that kind of planning, and Frank has died, and now Mary needs to go into a nursing home. The answer is stay tuned. So the next presentation I do is going to be about that. It's going to be about all of the legal issues that affect single people, right? Whether you are divorced or widowed or a widower or not married or never married, because this always comes up. I'll do these presentations, and people will say, "But what about me? You know, what are, what are the rules for me?" So that's. All I'm going to talk about next time is, is these issues, probate related, a bunch of stuff just having to do with single people. Now, there are a couple of ways in which the tax law changed um, this year as a result of that gigantic bill that the federal government passed. The Massachusetts law didn't change, but the federal one really did. And I want to talk about two of them. One of them, effectively at this point, there is no more gift tax. So, there has never been a Massachusetts gift tax, right? So if you give something away, first, the receipt of a gift, by the way, to, if you give money to your kids, the receipt of that gift by them is not income. So they're not paying income tax on that. But they're also, but, but, but many people think there is a gift tax. So if, if you make a gift, is, well, there has never been a Massachusetts gift tax. Now, I bet, though, that you think, how many of you think that if you give away a certain amount, more than a given amount of money to one of your kids or to somebody in a year, and I bet for some people the figure $15,000 is going to come to mind, that something bad happens? Anybody heard of that? Any, raise your hand if you've heard of that, that something, something bad happens. Do, do, you have any idea what, what, do you have any idea what bad thing happens if you give away more than $15,000? The answer is nothing bad happens. This is all made up. This is just all made up, right? Um, the way that works, now the reason for the 15,000, it's re, to un, the long part of the answer is I want you to understand this so you understand why that short answer is, it's all made up. There is no Massachusetts gift tax. The federal gift tax is, on, is part of a combined system. There's a combined gift and estate tax system. And the way the system works is if you die and you have an estate of worth more than a particular amount, then you're going to pay a federal estate tax on it. That amount is now 11 plus million dollars, right? So probably you're not going to have this problem, right? But in order to make sure that if you did have this problem, you didn't try to evade it by just giving everything away to get you down below the 11 million, right? They have a section of the law that says, if you give away in any one year to one person more than an amount, the original amount, that was, this was said about 20 years ago, it was $10,000. And now with inflation, it's up to $15,000. Then the additional amount gets subtracted from the amount that you can give away when you die, right? So if you give one of your kids this year $115,000, then the, the extra hundred, because you're going to allow them to give them $15,000 because that's your annual exclusion. The extra hundred gets subtracted from the 11 million that you were allowed to give after your death. So now you can only give $10,900,000, right? So you see, that's the long story. So now the short story, that really means that there's never, a, there's no gift tax. It has no effect at all. You can give away, and by the way, because of that, there is also, there, there is a gift tax, a separate gift tax, but like the, the, the other one, you get to give away $15,000 annually, and then in addition to that, there is what is now an $11 million lifetime exclusion. So there's never, you're never, so you, any amount you want to give your kids, at any time, you can just give it to them. It's not going to have an, a, a, any bad effect. Only going to have a good effect because it shrinks your estate. I'm going to talk about that later. So the only downside about doing that, I'm just going to mention this, is if you have 
uh, if your tax basis in that property is low, tax basis, what does that mean? So if you own something that you bought low and you're selling it high, like typically real estate or stock, then typically you have to pay, the, the difference between what you bought it for and what you sold it for is income to you. It's called capital gain and you have to pay a tax on that, capital gains tax, right? For example, St. Mary has had that house that they own, right? And they, and they bought it for $50,000 and they're selling it, and they sold it, want to sell it this year for $300,000. So in that case, their basis was $50,000, they're selling it for 300, so their capital gain is $250,000. So if it were not their house, if it were a cottage or any other piece of real estate, they would owe a capital gains tax on that capital gain, the difference of $250,000. And that tax would be about 15% federal and 5% state, 20% total, or about $50,000. Actually, that would be the capital gains tax. Now, in the case of their house, those rules don't apply because, or they, those rules do apply, but because they've been living in the house, if you can show you've lived in the house for two of the last five years, you get a capital gains exclusion, and those are big. Frank and Mary would each get a $250,000 exclusion. So as a practical matter, for most houses, they're not going to pay a, a capital gains tax. But the point is, in general, they would if it weren't their house. Um, if they give the house to their kids and the kids aren't living in the house, right, then the kids, when they get the house as a gift, um, they get their parents' basis in it. So now their basis is $50,000. If they turn around and sell the house before or after their parents die, they're going to pay a capital gains tax of about $50,000. On the other hand, if Frank and Mary hold that house until they die, um, at the moment of their death, uh, they, that basis in the house steps up to the date of death value. So if they hold it until they die and it's worth $300,000 and the kids sell it for $300,000, their capital gain is zero, right? Sales price minus the basis. And so there's no capital gains tax. So same thing, and everything I just said also applies to stock or any other asset that you have that you bought low and you're selling high. So if you're thinking about giving away stuff, those are the ones you may not want to give away. The medical deduction for seniors. Um, the medical deduction in general as a part of this change in the tax law actually improved uh, for everybody. And this was, I think, especially a big deal for seniors. The, the, the way the medical deduction works is that whatever you're spending on your me medical expenses, you get to deduct on your taxes to the extent that your expenses exceed a certain percentage of your income. And that percentage used to be 10%, and it actually went down to 7.5%. So if, for example, your combined income is $50,000, and your expenses, your medical expenses in the year, are more than 7.5% of that, or $3,750, the rest can be deducted as a medical deduction. And you think to yourself, well, that might be a little important, but it's not like really, really important. But listen to this. So suppose that you have a, have, a, have a serious, suppose you have dementia. Suppose your spouse has dementia. Suppose you have a serious physical ailment. And as a result, you need a lot of care at home, right? A lot of care. Not medical care. You don't need nurses, you don't need a, but you need a lot of care, right? Well, if you have a disability, and a disability means for, for this is out of the, the Internal Revenue Code, that you need substantial assistance with two of the activities of daily living, eating, transferring, toileting, bathing, dressing, continence. What is substantial assistance? It's whatever the doctor says substantial assistance is. So that's pretty flexible. It's your doctor, right? Uh, or if you need substantial supervision for health or safety purposes, because you got dementia and you might otherwise just walk out the door, you know, or do some things that wouldn't be good. Then, and if, and if your doctor or a licensed social worker or a nurse certifies that and has a plan that they've written out that says you really need extra care because of your situation, you need care. And if that care is necessary for diagnostic, preventative, therapeutic, curing, treating, mitigating, and read the end, maintenance and personal care services, right? Like a home care person who is coming in to help you out to do any number of things, right? Then that's a medical deduction. That's all a medical deduction, right? If you need to, if you are moving to an assisted living facility and your doctor has advised that because 
you, you are in one of those situations. Either you need help with two of the activities of daily living or you need the supervision. And your doctor says that you need to be in assisted living so that you'll have the care around you that's going to take care of that, right? And as far as your doctor is concerned, this was efficacious. It was working to help you, reducing your chances you're going to fall down. I mean, it isn't hard to justify moving to assisted living. That's the whole point of assisted living a lot of times, is to make you feel safer because you might fall down or whatever. Then the entire bill, the entire assisted living bill is a medical deduction, right? So imagine that, right? Because assisted living's three to four thousand dollars a month, right? Actually, three to seven thousand dollars a month. These are big bills, right? Or if you're getting a lot of home care at home, typically, it's, so it's a medical deduction. Now, this is important to you as a senior in a couple of ways. First, chances are a lot of your money is tax deferred money. It's IRA or 401k or other money that looks like that, that you've typically said to yourself, I never want to spend that ahead of time. I don't even want to take my required minimum distributions every year because I got to pay tax on them, right? Well, if you're able to deduct this, right? If you're having these big expenses at home, then that's exactly the money you want to use is your deferred money because now you take the money out in theory, it becomes income to you and on one side, but on the other side, you get to take the whole thing as a medical deduction, right? So you're really effectively getting to use 100% of these dollars. You're not, you're not giving a big chunk of them to the government, which is what you're trying to avoid. Same thing with capital gains. If that's the time to sell the stock, you know, or if you've got the cottage, don't use your cash, sell the cottage, right? The big capital gain that you were going to have to take, the big hit, don't have to do it. Well, you don't have to do it. It can be, it can turn into this medical deduction. The other thing you can do is you can gift some of this money to Peter. Remember Peter now? We're assuming he's the nice guy, right? And so suppose you've got this $100,000 expense, either because you or your wife need the home care or you've moved to assisted living. For whatever reason, you've got this big number, but you don't have a lot of income. So why does it help you? So suppose they gave uh, $100,000 to Peter. And suppose Peter paid the bill for the assisted living or for the home care. Well, if Peter is paying more than 50% of your total living expenses, right? And your total living expenses, if you have these kinds of home care bills or, or your assisted living, th this is, that's the big expense. That itself is going to be more than 50% of all your expenses. If that's the case, then the taxpayer can take you as a, a medical dependent, right? If you are a qualified relative, a spouse, a parent, an aunt, or an uncle. So if you gave Peter the $100,000, and remember, there's nothing bad about giving it away, right? There's no tax. And then he turned around and wrote those checks to the, to the assisted living every month or to the home care agency. And say Peter and his wife are, in a, are, are earning $165,000. Now, I bet all your kids aren't earning that, but there's a real possibility that one of them is, right? Given the nature of jobs and stuff, if both people are working, in that case, I mean, this always works, but I'm just, I'm just giving you the example at that level. In that case, given the current brackets that got established under the new law, they're in a 22% federal bracket. They're in a 5% Massachusetts bracket which means if they pay your $100,000 bill, they're going to reduce their tax bill by $27,000. Now, if Peter is a nice guy, and you don't know, you know, the question is you only do this if Peter's a nice guy, uh, then what he would do with that 27 that he just saved is that he'd put, leave it in the bank for you. So he is effectively then extending your money. He is extending Frank and Mary's money by taking advantage of this, okay? Uh, so that's dealing with life. Dealing with uh, life after death. This is not my problem. I can't figure that one. That one is beyond me. There are a whole lot of theories about what happens after that, but that's, I can't figure out. Dealing with what remains. First of all, dealing with the remains, which is what your body is after you die. You, it turns from your body into the remains. Um, first, you should know that organ donations can be made by your proxy of anything of, of your body, of any, anything in your body that a proxy is authorized to do that. It doesn't, even if you haven't signed on and it's not on your license or all that stuff, it used to be that that was the only way that organ donations could get made. That got changed about three years ago. So what the presumption now is that your proxy has the ability to give away anything of your remains. So if you don't want that to happen, you want to talk to your proxy about that. Because if you die in a hospital or in a nursing home, for example, 
um, the they can't even release the body until the proxy or somebody, but it's usually the proxy, has talked to the New England Organ Bank, which is the place where all of the organ donations go, and said, uh, no, I don't want to donate anything. Otherwise, uh, the, the, uh, under, the, under the law, the hospital's not supposed to release the body until the New England Organ Bank has said it's okay. Regarding the rest of your body, um, or all of your body if you didn't donate anything, um, you can always simply write a set of instructions regarding how you want to be treated. Oftentimes, they'll, people will do that with the funeral home. They'll actually leave a set of instructions with the funeral home. And that's legally binding, even though it's not part of your will or anything, right? And if you've left that set of instructions and you have a will, the personal representative under your will is, if, if he or she wants to do that, is the person that is, that is authorized to take care of all of those issues regarding your remains. Um, finally, dividing up the assets. Dividing up what remains after that. Well, uh, anything that you own that is just in your name at the moment of your death has to go through the probate process. The, pro the purpose of probate is to figure out at that point who gets the assets. There are two possibilities. Either you have a will or you don't. If you have a valid will, then the assets will go to those people named under your will. If you don't, there are a set of rules called the rules of intestacy. Those are the rules that say where the assets go if you don't have a will. They will never go to the commonwealth. Never. The reason for that is, if you have money, there will always be an, a an heir. An heir will always, always show up from somewhere. They'll hear about it. I've been doing this for 41 years, every time, right? So never worry about that. And if you're Frank and Mary in this case, and, and your plan was, if one of you dies, everything goes to the other, and then otherwise it gets divided among the kids, well, actually, you don't even need a will, because that's exactly what the rules of intestacy say. If one spouse dies, it all goes to the other, the two spouses are dead, it goes to the kids. So you may or may not need a will if you're Frank and Mary, but you may also be interested in trying to avoid that process altogether. And the reason for that is, uh, first, there's a delay. And the reason why the probate, probate process has to take at least a year is that following your death, your creditors have one year from the date of your death to file a claim against the probate estate to get paid. So, and, and so the assets can't be released to the people you want them to go to until that year has gone by, right? So it always takes a year. Second, you may have creditors. Uh, I have some clients in Nantucket, I was just talking to them, and they've got, you know, happily married, wonderful family, seven kids, everybody's okay, um, and they got a house that's in Nantucket, so $2 million. Everything in Nantucket's worth like this gigantic amount. They bought it for like 100000 you know, in the 1990. Um, but they, but they, some of the kids, you know, became, you know, doctors, lawyers, accountants. Some of them were the artists, you know, and they co-signed the college loans, right? So now there are these college loans that are still out there, and it's like $150,000 in college loans, you know, and they've made agreements with the company. They're going to pay them $50 a month, all this stuff, right? But they know following their death that there's going to be this house, right? And so they may want to avoid probate because if they can, then they avoid those claims. Because if the assets don't go through probate, the creditors are wiped out, okay? So there are basically two ways to avoid probate. One is to make sure that there is some living person uh, who you own that asset with as a joint tenant, with rights of survivorship. Because legally, if you own an asset, if two people own an asset, joint tenants with rights of survivorship, legally, you each own the whole asset. So like if you own your house, if you're married and you own your house together, you own it as tenants by the entirety, which is a form of joint tenancy. And the legal consequence when one of you dies is your interest simply evaporates, poof. And the other person becomes the sole owner, right? And so that asset never has to go through probate because the probate court is only there to figure out who owns things that are just in your name at the time of your death. So one, that's why typically when there are spouses and one spouse dies, there's no probate, right? Um, when the second spouse is alive, though, that's that single person, then they may want to be looking for these other routes. One way, the simplest, is to put one of your kids uh, names with you jointly on the assets so that you each own the asset jointly with rights of survivorship so that if you die the child gets it. The only one of the problems with that though is that of course the child now with you owns that asset and so if the child gets sued well then that asset can be attached and if the child wants to take the asset they can because they own it jointly with you with the rights of survivorship. So for folks who don't want to do that that's the reason why sometimes they will put stuff into trust. Um, they will, and, the, and, and that device is very simple. You just create a trust naming yourself 
as the trustee, or in the Frank and Mary's case, the two of them as the trustees for the benefit of themselves and their kids. Those are called the beneficiaries. But you say right in the trust, if we two of us are dead, we're going to name one of our kids, Peter, right, as the successor trustee. And we're going to say at that point that the trust becomes irrevocable, unamendable, and Peter has to go sell the stuff and divide it up among the three kids. So if you want to keep control of your assets while you're alive, while at the same time avoiding probate, that's the kind of the simplest, that's the simple way to do it. The cheapest is uh, joint ownership. Um, but, but for folks who want to keep total control, it's really the trust. And I'm just going to mention the car. Um, so the car is the, the most, the, 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 the asset that most often produces inadvertent probates. That people call and they go, I don't think we need to do a probate. All we got is this, and all we got is this old car. And I'm like, I don't care how old it is. If it's got a title to it and you die and you own it, unless there's a surviving spouse, um, then you got to go through probate because you need to get someone named as the personal representative for the benefit of the dead person to sign the new title. And so that's a real issue. So one easy way to deal with that, right, is once again to have somebody named with you jointly on your car. Right? Join out jointly with rights of survivorship so that when you die, that person owns it. And if it's one of your kids and they're like, oh, ma, you're a terrible driver. I don't want to be the, on the car. Well, just increase your insurance. You, know, you can take care of it that way. Now, I didn't think, this is one of those, I learned something, though, two weeks ago when I was in Milford. I was told, and you know, you can, should never just believe what you hear as a lawyer. You know, you're supposed to look it up. So I was told by a registry person that you can't put your car in trust and that therefore that option wasn't available. So that's what I said at the Milford presentation. I've been saying that for years. And one of the guys there then said, but wait a minute, I got my car in trust. Here's the, here it is, my, here's my registration. I said, come on. So I'm, I'm now researching that. I'll, be, I'll be, have the definitive answer on that for the next presentation. I didn't think you could actually put your car in trust, but could be. Um, the Massachusetts estate tax. This did not change last year, but I want you to be aware of it because people often don't quite get this. And so I just want to talk about it for a few minutes. First, everybody gets this. One spouse dies, you leave everything to the other. There's 100% marital deduction, so there is no taxable estate. The second person dies, though, um, and leaves a, a taxable estate of more than a million dollars, then there is an estate tax. Um, if the estate is less than a million dollars, there isn't. But, see, but I wanted you to just see this chart to see what happens. If your estate is a million dollars, the estate tax is zero. Your estate is a million one hundred thousand dollars. Your estate tax is forty thousand dollars. So the marginal rate on that first hundred thousand dollars is forty percent, right? Now, if your estate is a million two, notice the tax only goes up by like nine thousand dollars, or about nine percent. If your tax, if your estate's a million three, the tax only goes up to, by about six thousand dollars, or six percent. So there's this big effect that happens when you're just over which is why I wanted to mention it to you. So if you're in that kind of situation, I'm going to go back to that gifting section. That's the situation where you may want to give some stuff away to get yourself down to that million, because otherwise you're going to pay 40 cents on that, on those 40 percent of those dollars to the government, right? And if you may not want to give it away because you're like, well, no, I don't want to give it away. I don't have that much money. You know, in the old days, a million dollars was a lot of money, but you know. So, but what you might want to do is if you've named this, this person as your power of attorney, right, or your kids, you may want to tell them, right, if I get sick, this is what I want you to do. Give some of it away, like right away, or give it all, but give some of it away. Get me down below that number so that before I die, we're not throwing this $40,000 away by giving it to the Department of Revenue. Um, I'm just going to mention that if your assets are as high, even as high as $2 million in your spouse's, then you can actually avoid all of the estate tax in that case by doing some, I, I'm, just wanna, I'm just gonna leave it at the words, clever documents. You need to structure your assets so that when the first one of you dies, up to a million dollars that would have gone directly to the second spouse instead gets held in this trust. And you can even make the surviving spouse the trustee of that trust, but it, and it needs to have some magic language. But all, as long as it does, when the first spouse dies, the assets are considered to be part of the estate of the first spouse to die don't get included in the second spouse's estate. So effectively, you end up being able to give $2 million to your kids tax-free. The first million that goes into that trust and then the second million that is what's left with the surviving spouse. So I'm just mentioning that. Um, and, we, and we talked about that and that's it. So if you've got any questions on any of this, I know that we've, we have, 
We give copies of this tape to the folks at the Holliston um, um, cable station. Um, they haven't typically shown them, I don't think. But I'm just, I'm just telling you, they may go up on, on cable. Um, also, Frank and Mary have their own YouTube channel. It's called uh, Elder Law Frank and Mary. So if you want to see this or any of the presentations that I do, you can always go there. Any questions? Thank you very much. Appreciate it. We'll see you soon. Bye-bye.